This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Uh, I'm very uh, excited to uh, hear about the next presentation uh, because we are p possibly looking at uh, practice changing data related to um, you know, uh, the use of beta blocker for patients with cirrhosis. And I'm very pleased to introduce the next speaker. Uh, Danielle Brandman um, had a you know, very impressive run the last three years since joining the, uh, uh, the hepatology group. Um, um, she's established a very nice niche in fatty liver disease and also done a lot of great work related to the uh, uh, Transplant Hepatology Fellowship uh, Program as Associate Director. And uh, we are very proud of the fact that uh, she's a recipient of the uh, Excellence in Teaching Award at UCSF this year. Um, so uh, she's going to talk about this uh, really important topic about the use of beta blocker in patients with cirrhosis. Danielle? Okay, thank you, Francis, for that really nice introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be here talking about uh, this topic today, beta blockers and cirrhotics, friend or foe. Um, I know last year I was one of the debaters uh, talking about beta blockers as primary prophylaxis against uh, variceal bleeding, and I really touted the benefits of beta blockers. And while I believe most of what I said last year, delving <laughs> a little bit more into the data, and it really calls into question a little bit about, you know, is the beta blocker really the hepatologist equivalent of the cardiologist aspirin or statin? Um, I also thought it was pretty clever in coming up with this title until I realized that there was a paper out there that has a very similar title. So not as creative as I thought. Anyway, um, I did want to start the discussion uh, framing it with a case just so we can make this a little bit more real life. So we have a 55-year-old woman who has NASH cirrhosis, child's B. She has moderate ascites on diuretics. She also has hepatic encephalopathy with no prior history of variceal bleeding. She's undergoing her first screening endoscopy and is noted to have medium varices. So just want to see a show of hands just to take a poll. How many of you would start this patient on beta blockers? Well, I didn't convince you guys last year. I thought I did. <laughs> um, OK, and then what if the patient's a little bit sicker? Child C cirrhosis, refractory ascites. Now how many of you would start beta blockers? Thank you, Marion, and the two other people that raised their hands. All right. So, Let's go into the, the data. So what's really clear and what I presented last year is you know, ASLD guidelines that support use of beta blockers for primary prophylaxis against variceal bleeding. I'm not going into those details this year because again, that's really clear, discussed it last year. The data for preventing variceal bleeding is secondary prophylaxis, also very clear. Again, part of the guidelines, strong evidence. What's also pretty clear about beta blockers is that they're not helpful in patients who've not yet developed varices. And this is data that's derived from the randomized control trial comparing timolol and placebo um, with the data uh, published in New the New England Journal about 10 years ago. And all of these patients at study entry did not have varices. And what was seen was that beta blockers had no impact on the development of varices, rates of decompensation, death, or need for transplant. What they did see was that patients on beta blockers had higher rates of adverse events, with the rate of serious adverse events being approximately three times that of the patients treated with placebo. We're all well aware of the potential side effects of beta blockers, which include bronchospasm, bradycardia, blunting of recovery from hypoglycemia, depression, fatigue, and sexual dysfunction. So again, these three slides have really shown what's clear. I think 
no one would really question that data. So the rest of uh, the data I'm going to present is really a little bit more of a gray area. It's really not so cut and dry. And I first want to talk about beta blockers and the hemodynamic response. And there's a lot of work coming out of Spain. There's a lot of uh, hepatic venous uh, pressure gradient measurements. I'm just looking at you know, how good are our beta blockers. So uh, the first study included 90 patients who had had a history of variceal bleeding, median MELD was 13, about a quarter of the patients had child C cirrhosis, and all patients were treated with non-selective beta blockers with or without nitrates. For now, we're going to ignore that these patients were on nitrates and just focus on the beta blocker component. What I do want you to take note of is how a response to beta blocker is defined according to the hepatic venous pressure gradient. Patients were considered to be non-responders if their HVPG remained greater than 12 and or the gradient decreased by less than 20% from baseline. Just keep this in mind for the future slides since I will be uh, referring to response and non-response. The patients who did respond to beta blockers in this trial were followed with annual serial HVPG measurements. And what they saw was about, uh, in, in the patients who did respond to beta blocker therapy, they were more likely to survive without a transplant than the patients who did not respond, with hemodynamic non-responders having a twofold greater hazard of dying or needing to undergo transplant. And the difference between the two groups was statistically significant. They followed the patients uh, uh, longer term uh, if they had initially responded to beta blockers. And what they saw was that some patients over time did lose response. And these patients that lost response also seemed to have poorer survival and increased need for transplant. So again, keep in mind that patients who are initially responders to beta blockers are not always going to be responders. This was some more data uh, that came out of uh, Barcelona that was looking at beta blockers and the risk of decompensation in terms of development of new ascites in patients who had large varices but had not had variceal bleeding. What they saw in the patients who were hemodynamic responders was that only a quarter of the patients developed ascites compared with almost all of the patients who were non-responders. They did dichotomize the results according to MELD score, and the, the graph that was, uh, the figure that's included is a little bit incorrect. Uh, patients with MELDs are greater than or equal to 10, um, despite being responders, were more likely to develop ascites in the patients with MELD score less than nine. But again, the point being that if you were a responder to a beta blocker, lower risk of developing ascites. And this point is further illustrated on uh, this uh, survival curve, um, looking at probability of uh, being free of ascites over time. But we have to keep in mind, the non-responders had poor adherence to beta blocker therapy, and at baseline, they were slightly sicker than the responders. So thinking that it might not just be response to beta blocker therapy, it's also adherence, and who is the patient to begin with. So the patients who were non-responders also were more likely to die than the patients who did respond. And the difference was not statistically significant, likely due to power issues. So, Moving on to patients who've actually decompensated, because I think this is really where a lot of the, the questions arise. Once our patient gets sick, what do we do? So thinking about the patient with refractory ascites who's going in for weekly or twice monthly paracentesis, we have to consider the condition paracentesis-induced circulatory dysfunction, which has been described as systemic vasodilation, decreased effective arterial blood volume, and increased in plasma renin activity following a large volume paracentesis. So I think we've all had many patients who go in for their therapeutic tap, removal of eight liters of ascites, and shortly thereafter, they crash. Their pressure bottoms out. So the, this is really exactly the, the condition that we're thinking of. So just to give a name to it, PICD. Um, so the French group um, chose to look at uh, PICD using patients as their own controls. And they looked at various hemodynamic parameters, but what I'm going to focus on is what is the plasma renin concentration. And they measured it prior to paracentesis, 
immediately after and seven days after paracentesis. And what they saw was that when the patients were on beta blockers, there was a sharp increase in the plasmarenin concentration, and that increase actually persisted for a week post paracentesis. However, when the patients were not on beta blockers, you can see that the renin concentration actually remains pretty flat across all of the different time points. So why do we care about renin? It's not something that we measure. Well, I think we have to think back to what is the basic pathophysiology for development of, of ascites, which I know we're all well aware of, but I think sometimes helpful to go back to the basics just to remind us and try to figure out what's going on. Um, so we know that portal hypertension, of course, due to the increase in hydrostatic pressure, is uh, one of the contributors to ascites formation. But we also have to remember about the activation of the renin-angiotensin system. And when we're doing therapeutic paracentesis, if our actions are resulting in this rise in the renin concentration, we are stressing an already taxed renin-angiotensin axis, leading to increased aldosterone secretion, which will then act on the kidney and lead to more salt and water retention. So we're really fueling the fire of the patient with refractory ascites. So again, calls into question, should our patients with refractory ascites be treated with beta blockers, we might be help hurting them more than helping them. Um, the French group also chose to look at, further at survival in their patients with refractory ascites who were treated with beta blockers, and the patients on beta blockers tended to do much worse than the patients who were not on beta blockers. And in their multivariable models, beta blockers were still associated with a 2.6-fold increased risk of death as compared with the non-beta block patients. Again, taking into account this was not a randomized control trial, the patients were slightly different. Not surprisingly, they had lower heart rates and systolic blood pressure, but they were probably a little bit sicker as well, as their bilirubin was higher, and more of the patients on beta blockers had varices, which was expected. Um, but surprisingly, their MELD score, MELD-NA, and creatinine were similar between the two groups. So, you know, again, some markers of patients might be sicker, but in other, way, other ways, they are somewhat similar. But why might this be happening? Why are beta blockers so bad, kind of beyond the, the renin angiotensin axis stimulation? The other concern is that beta blockers might be blunting that compensatory increase in cardiac output that occurs in patients who are already hyperdynamic and they undergo paracentesis and they want to compensate. They're on a beta blocker. They can't. So this might lead to worsened hypotension in patients who already have a baseline low SVR, and this might also decrease renal perfusion. And we know that renal function is an important predictor of survival in our patients with end-stage liver disease. So moving on a bit to further complications of uh, our decompensated patients, and we have to explore the relationship between beta blockers and SBP. So I think everyone is aware that our patients with cirrhosis and portal hypertension tend to have increased gut permeability, and that's thought to be the driver behind the risk of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. And the factors that can contribute to the increased permeability may be decreased velocity of intestinal blood flow, edema and erosions in the gut related to altered microcirculation, as well as bacterial overgrowth due to impaired gut motility in these patients. Um, so there was a small study that included 50 patients. Again, the patients served as their own controls, and they were assessed prior to and after initiation of beta blocker therapy, and they evaluated surrogate markers of gut permeability. They looked at urinary sucrose and mannitol concentrations five hours after the patients ingested a cocktail of lactulose, sucrose, and mannitol, which I know sounds really delicious. Um, so, and this method of assessing gut permeability has been validated in the past. Um, they did look at the hepatic venous pressure gradient, and they did see that there were significant decreases in HVPG pre and post beta blockers. So they're, they're doing what they're supposed to do. Um, and these pink lines are really indicating the threshold for what's considered to be increased gut permeability. So what we see is that almost all of the patients 
have improvement uh, to the point where the, the gut is less permeable after initiation of beta blockers, looking at the urinary sucrose, sucrose mannitol ratio, as well as their intestinal permeability index. So what does this mean? Maybe beta blockers can actually decrease the incidence of SBP if we believe their data. Well, there have been several studies that have actually looked at this. Uh, relatively small sample size, uh, variable quality, some are randomized control trials, some are not. Um, and also the severity of illness in each of the studies is a little bit different as well. That being said, taking the data at face value, it does appear as though patients who were treated with beta blockers had lower risk of development of SBP than the patients who were in the control groups. So, interesting. Well, what happens if our patients actually develop SBP? Beta blockers might not be quite as good as we think in this condition. Um, so this was another small study included uh, just under 200 patients, not a randomized control trial, comparing patients who were and were not treated with beta blockers. And we see that the patients who were treated with beta blockers tended to have poorer survival. The differences were not statistically significant, and I think this is really a power issue. And if they had stopped following at just one year, I think they would have achieved statistical significance. But again, calling into question that if beta blockers can prevent SBP, why are they so bad once the patient develops SBP? In the same study, they saw that the patients who developed SBP and were on beta blockers had about a two-fold increased risk of developing hepatorenal syndrome or acute kidney injury. So again, maybe going back to um, the issue of uh, decreased renal perfusion um, as a consequence of beta blocker use in these patients. The thing to consider uh, when looking at this data is, as I've alluded to with some of the other papers, is that the patients who are being treated with beta blockers tend to be different than the patients who are not on beta blockers. In this study, the patients were more, more often child C cirrhotics, and they had higher bilirubin. That being said, the meld was similar between the two groups. So just to uh, summarize what we've talked about up to this point, we know that beta blockers can have beneficial effects in our patients with cirrhosis with pretty strong evidence that it can prevent variceal bleeding, both from a primary and a secondary prophylaxis standpoint with limited evidence that beta blockers may reduce gut permeability, thereby reducing the risk of incidence of SBP and potentially decreasing the risk of decompensation, especially if they respond to beta blockers. But we have to consider the negative effects that we're seeing with beta blockers, such as poor survival in patients who have refractory ascites and increased morbidity with higher risk of acute kidney injury and hepatorenal syndrome when the patients go on to develop SBP, while keeping in mind that these perceived effects of beta blockers may actually be due to the fact that they're sicker patients and may not have anything to do at all with the beta blockers. We also have to remember that the beta blocker effect may vary over time and that a lot of patients may stop it on their own or clinicians might stop it for good reason for hypotension, dizziness, and that the patients might stop responding over time as well. So really what we're left with at this point is a drug that looks so darn good but then it seems to have some really negative consequences as well. And how could this one drug be so good yet so bad and seem like, seems like it works differently at different points in time? Well, there's been growing interest in the window hypothesis, thinking about what is the right therapeutic window for our patients to be treated with beta blockers, thinking that this is really not a cross-sectional look at a patient. You have to look at them over time. Um, so, this figure was taken from the Journal of Hepatology paper that should have been included in your folders, and I think really nicely summarizes the data that, uh, that exists and that I've presented. So I think this part of the window, before you actually get into ther the therapeutic window, is clear. The early cirrhotics who have no signs of portal hypertension, no varices, should not be taking beta blockers. There's really no indication. But following them over time as they get sicker, 
they develop varices, and they still have the cardiac reserve that's intact, that's not going to be blunted significantly by beta blockers, these patients should be started on beta blockers. However, as they get sicker, we have to reassess their need for beta blockers as well as the safety as they don't have that cardiac reserve that they did when they were the child's B cirrhotic and only moderate ascites rather than refractory. So this leads me to another figure that was uh, uh, present in that journal hepatology uh, paper, which I know is clear as mud, I know. Um, <laughs> you, can some, you can use it as a little bit of a roadmap and reassessing your patient over time and figuring out, okay, where are they at this point in time? I think the things to point out or that you, know, you have a screening endoscopy, medium large varices, consider starting the beta blocker, but assess them over time. Again, remembering you have to keep reassessing the patient every time you see them, and I think you can't think about, okay, once on a beta blocker, always on a beta blocker. And as they're getting sicker with episodes of sepsis, hepatorenal syndrome, refractory ascites, we do wanna think about stopping the beta blockers. That being said, I know it's very confusing, and this is that wonderful sign that's in between uh, Mission and Van Ness. So, <laughs> all right, so to bring us back to the, the first case, our child's B cirrhotic who has moderate ascites and encephalopathy, and she has medium varices. Who would start this patient on beta blockers? Oh, good, more, thank you. Um, and then what about the child C. cirrhotic who has refractory ascites, who would start on beta blockers? What if they were on beta blockers, who would stop them? Okay, all right. Very good. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, wonderful job. Um, questions for, okay. yes, is it Jeff? Oh, no, no, Brock. <laughs> Brock. Hey, Daniel. I, you know, a lot of your early data was really looking at the uh, venous pressure gradient. And we see that used a lot more in Europe than we do here. What do you think about maybe pushing that to do a little bit more full directed therapy? So the question was, you know, there are all of these European studies um, that are looking at hepatic venous pressure gradient to see are our patients actually responding to beta blockers? Are they doing what we think? I think we have to think about a couple of things. If you look at the doses of beta blockers that are used in Europe compared with in the U.S., they are much, much higher. Um, you know, it could be that some of the patients are not quite as sick, but also I think some of our patients may not be quite as tolerant as the European patients, um, because sometimes in these, in these papers you see propranolol doses of 120 milligrams total per day and upwards, and I mean, I, I can't get any of my patients above 20 milligrams BID, so I, I'm impressed. Um, so, so that being said, I think that if we did HVPG measurements in our patients, we, we would probably see that we're not making the impact that I think we are. Yeah. Uh, Mankti? Uh, one beta blocker better than the others, for example, the amplitude correct better than other more or any more. So if I heard you correctly, was the question, is one beta blocker better than the other? Um, so there really haven't been that many head-to-head -head papers really looking at is natalol better or propranolol. I think in, in terms of tolerance or at least adherence, you, know, you would think that a once daily uh, medication like natalol, uh, patients might at least be a little bit more adherent, but I did not come across any papers looking at risk of decompensation or death, need for transplant, comparing the two. Jean-Marie. I'm aware of the indication of like what you explained, but have you come across any studies of uh, side effects of stopping the beta blockers? Like people who would like have an episode of bleeding after stopping the beta blockers? Right. So, so the question was, what happens when we stop the beta blockers? So the concern when you stop a beta blocker suddenly is that you may have this rebound in the portal uh, portal pressure, and you may increase the patient's risk of bleeding. You know, that has not been that well studied, but it is a potential concern. And um, I know it was very small in that figure that I showed, but the little asterisk on the stop sign said that if you're going to stop beta blockers, you should actually consider weaning them for that exact reason, worrying about precipitation of uh, variceal bleeding. Yes. <laughs> 
So how do you recommend titrating this? <laughs> so we typically follow the, the heart rate. Um, and we'd expect to see at least a 10% reduction in heart rate, but we're really aiming for heart rate 55 to 60, but thinking that you know, the main limiting factor, patient side effects, as well as systolic blood pressure. And when we're seeing our patients with refractory ascites, even before you start you know, beta blocker, they, they have a systolic blood pressure of 105, 95. So a lot of them are just not going to tolerate the, the beta blockers. So, and also from a resource utilization perspective, I think it'd be really challenging for us to get HVPG measurements on, on all of our patients. Tony. Respondent versus non-respondent is a very interesting characterization. And do you see anything in that data that differentiates between a true therapeutic effect, beta blockers, and a respondent and non-respondent, or just simply a selection of a specific population that has a much better prognosis, and in their behavior, in a physiological behavior, they respond very well? Yeah, so the... the yeah, yeah. So, the, so the question was, in terms of comparing responders versus non-responders to beta blockers, you know, was there anything that pointed to, well, who, who is really responding and who derives the most benefit? And, and I would say it's, it's not really clear who is going to respond and who's not going to respond, but the patients who were non-responders tended to be sicker. Um, the, the differences between the two groups were not always statistically significant, but there were definitely trends. And, you know, my sense is that, you know, the, the sicker patients who have the lower SVR and that lack of that uh, cardiac compensatory response, even without beta blockers, they might, they might not have that response. Yeah. Yes? That first case scenario you mentioned, uh, where a patient has established uh, Pharisees and uh, moderate diuretics using the beta blocker for all those beneficial effects, in real life, some of these patients may be taking uh, uh, inhibitors of the renal angiotensin system, like low dose lysinopril for diabetic property. Maybe they may even be on now dosrom for the medical therapy of uh, the sinus. So those studies you quote, what percentage of patients actually are also on compound? So, so the question was in the studies um, that, I sh that I showed, how many patients were taking ACE inhibitors or uh, ARBs um, or you know, the diuretic doses? And that was not really looked at closely. I will say that as our patients are getting sicker and they're treated with diuretics, my experience has been when the patients are on ACEs or ARBs, they run into a lot of issues with renal failure, electrolyte abnormalities, um, and their blood pressure is starting to drop. So my first step is usually to advise stopping the ACE or the ARB for those reasons. Yeah. Uh, if for, for both primary and secondary prophylaxis, if you've already performed bad ligation on the patient and they, you already eradicated their varices, how much additional effect would the beta blockers be? <coughs> In, in terms, terms of, of uh, bleeding or in terms of decompensation? Yeah. So the question was, if, you, if you've banded the patients to uh, eradication, what is the additional benefit of uh, beta blockers in those patients? And, and in terms of decompensation, you know, I, I don't think that those patients would necessarily benefit from beta blockers, because if you're going to ban them, then you could argue, well, they don't need the beta blockers, so you've kind of eliminated that, that from the equation. Um, for primary prophylaxis, you know, it's recommended to try one or the other, not necessarily both. For secondary prophylaxis, there's some data to support use of uh, banding plus beta blockers, but you can do one or the other. Okay. Pretty good. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you.